I'd like to share an experience I had teaching with all of you that ultimately changed a lot of my perspectives on this profession and on relationships. We like to tell ourselves, those of us that are moving past high school, that we remember what it was like. Remember what it was like to be in high school, to be 15. You know, I, I was 15 once, but I'm not certain we all actually remember. I mean, if you see the dance moves in a new music video and they make you feel a little bit awkward, or if you are just incredulous, you can't believe that somebody would write or draw that on a desk. Or maybe you're walking down the hallway and someone's talking and you think, oh, I can't unhear that. Well, maybe you don't actually remember what it was like because you're a few years or a career or a family a world away. There was a student that reminded me what it was like to be in high school. And regardless of their age or their gender or their name, for the purposes of this story, I'm just going to say that their name is Marty and that they're a guy. So Marty walks into my room and I'm seated behind my desk and on my left is a copy of the test that Marty cheated on. I can tell from his impish greeting that he knows this is not going to be one of those fun conversations. And he didn't have to admit to anything. So I had some judgment calls to make. I love this job, but I think one of the most difficult parts of it are the judgment calls that you're making every minute of every day. You need to make them with authority. You need to make them in a split second. And you kind of need to be right when you make them. So a student has their head down at their desk, and you don't let people sleep in your class. Well, did they finish their work early? Are they taking a moment to think? Maybe they're sleeping. Or are they upset? Maybe they're depressed. Or you want to take your class outside for 10 minutes on a beautiful 60-degree day, and a student is refusing to go outside. And you ask them why, and they say, it's too cold. And you say, oh, come on, let's, let's just go outside for 10 minutes, come back inside, and you can warm up. And they look you in the eye, and they say, I'll be dead by then. <laughs> or phones. Phones. Oh, I hate phones. Those backlit monsters. Because Janie has propped a book up, and she's clearly texting behind the book. And you're just about to go in and intercept when you remember that she said something to you the other day about a family situation that she might need to handle. So, OK, you know what? I'm going to let that one slide. But Jeremy has seen that you see Jamie texting. And you've already taken Jeremy's phone away because he was showing the entire class a video of a guy pepper spraying himself in the face. So Jeremy sees you. You see Jamie. Jamie doesn't see any of this because she's texting. And Jeremy's expecting you to take her phone away because you took his away. And it's just enough to make you politely ask her to put her phone away. Was that the right call? Is that fair to Jeremy? I'm really glad that I was of a certain age when social media came around, or else I'd be like my dad, asking for help how to make a MyFace account. <laughs> but in all seriousness, if you look past the what and instead look at the who, it can be very helpful. Now, I think one of the toughest judgment calls you can make as a teacher is that that responds to cheating. Why? Because there is no faster way to completely destroy the relationship that you had with a student than to do the right thing by catching them doing the wrong thing. It can extinguish everything that you two had. And they're humiliated. They think that you hate them. And of course, you don't hate them. But it is a little more difficult to trust them now. And it's almost like in these situations, the best thing that you can hope for is to minimize the damage. But what about growth? Isn't there an opportunity for something positive to happen? As it turns out, in my interaction with Marty, catching him cheating was the best possible thing that could have happened for our relationship. So back to the story. Marty's in my room, I'm behind my desk, and he very quickly admits that he cheated changed three answers on the test, three points. And I don't know how this is going to go, but I have a question that I just, I've got to ask him, which is, you know, three points on a 30-point test, and there are many tests in this class, and there are hundreds of points. And so I ask him, 
Why would you put it all on the line for just three points? And the honesty of his answer astounded me. He said, I'm just sick of failing. See, Marty wasn't a model student. He wouldn't raise his hand. He didn't turn in assignments. He wouldn't ask questions. He wouldn't seek out any help. In fact, I think the only times we talked was when I approached him, and clearly that wasn't working that well. But when he told me that he was just sick of failing, I instantly knew what was going on. Desperation. He was desperate. I've been there. I think we all have. But when you look past the what and instead look at the who, things can be a lot clearer. So I started running through the list of things that I could do in this situation. I said I could write a referral, send you off to the dean or the principal. I could call home, have a conversation with your parents about this. I could give you a zero with no opportunity to make this up. And his eyes were so wide. And I said, I'm not going to do any of those things. I'm going to let you retake this test. I don't let you do it for full credit. But there's something you have to do for me. Every day, Marty, you need to come into my class before school, after school, during class, it doesn't matter, but every single day you're going to have to come into my room, and when you do that, Marty, you're going to talk to me. You're going to ask me the questions that you have. You're going to tell me what's confusing you. We're going to figure this whole thing out, and you're not going to fail my class. Does that sound good to you? And Marty said, nothing. He was just smiling. He didn't have to say anything. And that's when I knew something had gone right. I ended up having one of the strongest relationships I've ever had with a student, with Marty. And he passed my class. And it astounds me to this day that the reason that that happened was not in spite of cheating, but rather because of it. For once, cheating didn't burn a bridge. It actually helped build one. So I leave you with this. The next time you find yourself at odds with the way a person is acting or feeling, know that the opportunity to connect with them is there. It might be difficult to see or seemingly impossible to find, or maybe you're just human and you can't always cross that bridge into their world. But know that you have, and know that you can, and know that you have this amazing power and opportunity to try. There are some really unexpected places to build bridges with people. And when you look past the what and instead look at the who, amazingly positive things can happen. Thank you.